writing the actual song lyrics to play it, I was like, oh, imagine there's no heaven. Wait, you know, no hell below. So it got to the point where I started realizing there's, they, he wants to imagine a way everything in life. And I didn't have a name for that. I didn't know what that was called, but I was like, that doesn't seem right. And eventually, you know, a couple of years later, I'm discovering this is pretty much a nihilistic song. This is a song about complete, you know, just absence of all possessions, absence of everything. Uh, so then what are we living for? What What is meaningful then? And then the, the cliche answer, of course, would be love. But if you don't have heaven or hell, you don't have possessions, you don't have good relationships, then there's no love. Where's the love in all that? Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle, and this is The Conservative Take. Today, we have a special interview today. We have a special guest, I believe, out of the state of New Jersey. His name is Angel Kiros, and you're going to love this guy. I fell in love with him from watching one video of him. We're going to bring him on. And if this is your first time here, we do culture, TV, and movies, and politics, and whatever's going on, and we filter it right and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're really going to talk about what Angel has to say. And I'm going to just let you hear what he has to do. I'm going to bring him on right now. And let's uh, bring him on. What's up, man? Great to be here. Thank you Mr. so much. Mr. Kiros, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited. Yes, to sir. My sure. pleasure. I just want to tell you real quick, I'm so grateful to you for just sharing some of my content when you first saw it, because it helped me out so much. And just it gave me such encouragement, you know? I, I just uh, I felt I had to because I, I was so impressed by uh, by you and I felt you know if I don't get on him now I'll never get a chance to interview him so <laughs> because this, this guy is and I'm not just saying this dude you're I'm, you're going places I think and I'm gonna let you let the audience see for themselves what I've already seen and I, I know it's just gonna be fantastic I'll yeah. tell you you're I'll say this real quickly I'll shut up but your why I left the left video there's a link below if after this video watch that immediately. I had me captivated. 17 minutes, I couldn't, when it was over, I was mad. I was like, What's, <laughs> that's it? <laughs> so anyway, so tell us about yourself, Angel. Tell us about uh, you, uh, your, your, your story. Uh, I want to get into the main topics you want to talk about. We talked about a little bit about what Christianity. We talked about a little bit about, about uh, being a Latino, Hispanic. I think uh, I think you said you're from Peru. You're Peruvian. Is that correct? And we'll get into that. But I want to just kind of tell the audience who you are, your story, and just Take some time to to share with uh, what I've already heard and uh, what our audience is about to hear. I love it, man. Thank you so much for that. Uh, pretty simple. My name is Angel Kiros. I grew up in New, New Jersey. I'm born and raised here. So, you know, everything around me has always been Jersey, Jersey bread. Right? I, uh, I went to Florida for, for college for a couple of years. I studied fashion down there and then I moved back up here and kind of continued my education with uh, graphic design and stuff. So away video was mostly about how the culture that I was surrounding myself by, which was like a very uh, progressive kind of free love, hippie, Woodstock era kind of stuff. Um, all of that kept re uh, giving me these ideals that didn't really match who I was. And it wasn't really until I had a, a, I guess, a faith awakening, I became a Christian, that I started to question those ideals, you know, simple things like the idea of free love or the idea of doing whatever you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody. I think, I think there's something to be said for Christian accountability that I hadn't looked at in the same way before. And um, the more I explored my Christianity and the more I, I dived into theology and, and apologetics and stuff, the more I was starting to change my political opinions. So, you know, going from something like the pro-choice movement that was very much you know, about liberty on the surface, it seems like, you know, the, the freedom to do whatever you want with your body, the more I looked into it, and the more I paired it with my with my faith, the more I was like, that's just not a good enough argument for me. And things like that slowly started happening. And I became more and more, uh, I guess, inclined to look up, look up uh, political views and starting with the left kind of stuff, you know, stuff that's mainstream, uh, uh, Trevor Noah and all this stuff. And then just as I dug deeper, I started to discover voices like Louder with Crowder and, and Ben Shapiro and um, Candace Owens wasn't even on the scene at the time, you know, people like that. And um, eventually I just kind of found myself thinking, wow, I've I'm, I've just been a Republican my whole life. <laughs> yeah, and it just kind of surprised me. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, end up feeling that way, too. We, we have this idea of, of what being a liberal is or what being a Democrat is. And again, this isn't about Democrat or Republican. It's about ideology, like as you probably will talk about 
uh, again. But um, I found it fascinating that like you're talking about um, John Lennon. And I thought that was a pretty, pretty good. And you, I guess you, were you said you were a skater that as well, too? You, you uh, kind I, played of I played in rock bands and stuff like that, bar bands. Yeah, I, I played in a band too, but it was a Christian band. But so I, probably a little okay. different there. But 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 the whole the whole concept of you embracing, I guess, this quote unquote hippie uh, culture. Can you talk about that a little bit? What your thoughts were of being in that, and how you and how that is different in terms of what you are now in terms of the worldview? Yeah, a lot of the hippie culture uh, or the free love Woodstock culture is is very much about fulfilling your own desires, right? And and it's fulfilling your own desires at the expense of your future. And it, 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 on the surface, it seems like it's really about living in the moment and very kind of spiritual energy and making sure that you're one with the universe and stuff like that. But when I, when I gave my life to Christ, it, I started seeing that, that there's immediate ramifications for everything that you do in life. And the hippie culture, if you want to call it that, was the complete antithesis to that, where it said you shouldn't care about the ramifications. You should just kind of do whatever pleases you, and eventually you'll find some kind, some kind of purpose in that. And I, I got kind of left. You know, I used to smoke tons and tons of weed all day, every day, and this was just continuing to spiral. And it got to the point where I hit rock bottom, and I was like, I have no purpose in life. I have nothing that I'm striving for. I have nothing that I'm that I'm willing to give my life for or to dedicate my life to. And trying to find that purpose is where I stumbled into uh, people like Jordan Peterson, who kind of restored or he, he uh, reinstilled those Christian values into me. And um, just people like my pastor, who, who did a huge job for me when, when it comes to teaching me what purpose really is. And those things really solidified for me the groundwork for building an actual functional life within a society. And then I kind of took that and extrapolated it out and, and started to figure out, well, what's best for our society? And that's where politics came into the picture. Wow, dude, you are impressive, man. I I, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> I, could listen to you. I, I think we are so connected in so many different things. Maybe I can come on your show and give you Absolutely. my story, but I think it may be a mirror image of each other. Um, you mentioned one thing on your, you mentioned one thing on your video, and I want to give spoilers. If it's spoiler alert, if you haven't heard watched the video yet. But you said one thing that was so profound. I was like, wow, this, this dude is awesome. You said, um, you said that people were compassionate, uh, I guess, in your community, of the leftist community. They were compassionate for the sake of being compassionate, but they were being performative. Yes. I thought that was a really, really powerful word. Can you, can you expound upon that a little bit more? Yeah, I'll take it from the from the Christian perspective of today, right? And and the the modern, I guess, the modern compassion of, let's say, what a Christian would be like in the mainstream. Uh, for me, it seemed so much more like a like a performance when people were, let's say, posting the black squares or or saying Black Lives Matter or or doing whatever it was that was the trend of the time, you know, at, at the time. And and for me, that wasn't enough. You know, for me, it's like okay, if we're really all going to care about a specific kind of movement, we need to all be doing something for that. I mean, if you if you. If you back through history, even let's say Woodstock, I'll use that as an example, people left their homes and they went to a specific place and they protested or they did, they did these huge um, music movements. And it was, there was heart behind it. Whereas now it's all very, um, I, I think the best word is performative. It's all, it's all just a show, just to show other people that, that you're on the same uh, train of thought as them. And to me, that seemed really hypocritical because a lot of the people doing it, I know, and a lot of the people doing it, two months ago, did not care in the slightest about politics or about the black community. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there are these, you know, these activists. And I'm just like, I have to, now I have to say something. Now you've cornered me into the place where now I have to actually say all of the things that I've been learning the past four or five years, I have to actually start speaking about. You know what? Um, we're going to have to talk again if you'll let me to. You, I, we're not going to have enough time to talk about everything. I, I, I tell you, you are so ahead of your time. I, I think what you just said there, is so powerful, and uh, I, I'm kind of I want to go off script a little bit. Yeah. But the, the but the, the fact that you come to that conclusion that people were these I guess these hashtags and the ribbons and I guess I'm speaking for you, but I'm assuming this is what you're meaning, you know, and, and you know, the the blackout with the icons and stuff like that. Yes. And how it's just essential. It's almost like almost like a fad. Almost. Would you attribute it that as well? But then you also attribute it to the fact of of it being counteractive to what the Christian faith is all about. Yeah, so that that idea goes a little bit deeper for me with with the idea of like Marxism and uh, communism and what what the idea of Marx had, where people are pinning each other against each other due to the color of their skin, 
where Christianity is is a place where we come to all unite under one banner, which is the name of Jesus. And and for me, I was starting to see Christian people completely forgetting that the standard for for a good person or the standard for a saved person is the faith their faith in Jesus, and instead um, making victims of people simply because of the color of their skin. Now, this would be, I guess, okay with me if every single person, black person that I knew agreed with this, but it was split right down the middle. Like I, I knew a lot of black people that were not on board with this, some that were questioning and some that were totally about it to the point where they kind of excommunicated, excommunicated me from, from their social lives. And um, for me, that was a big indicator of the fact that this isn't what it's cut out to be. So as I started digging through, uh, you know, the Jordan Peterson stuff and learning about who Karl Marx was, uh, I started noticing that this is part of a bigger th philosophy. It's part of a bigger worldview called Marxism, or um, as as uh, Vody Bachman talks about, ethnic Gnosticism, right? Where you know something specific because of your ethnicity that I could never know. And that, that to me is some sort of a lofty idea that, that has way bigger roots in it than simply saying uh, there's police brutality and we need to fix it. Wow. Well, first of all, the fact that you listen to Jordan Peterson means that you're at a higher level to begin with, right? Jordan Peterson is at a level of like just he's he's so out there in terms of his uh, intelligence. Say, yeah, I was totally confused when I first heard him. I did not know what I was listening to. And, and I was just forcing myself like I'm going to listen until I understand this. Yeah, he is. He is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. So let me back up a little bit. So I kind of jumped ahead, but I want to ask this question to you. So, all right, so my audience wants want to know how does someone like? For, let me just say this: They're going to want to know. They want their neighbor to be like you. They're going to want their son to be like you. They're going to want their daughter to think like you. They're going to want anyone to think like you. How is it? Is it something special that you had in yourself? Is it God's grace? Is it just your intellect? Was it something that happened? Was it um? That they got you to the point because in your interview, again, spoiler alert to his <laughs> to his video, you said you wanted to be educated. How can how can someone come to the age of walking away to the point that you did? Um, is it built in or is it just something external or what? Do you think that's such a great question? I'm so glad you asked it. I think I mean obviously for me, the priority is that God gave me the grace to be able to see things in a different perspective, and He got, He called me in, into being part of His kingdom, but. On a physical or, or a a uh, I get yeah a physical level, I'd have to say, and I've thought about this a lot since making that. Uh, it has to be my parents, right? Like my my parents are both immigrants from Peru. Um, my mom came here way after my dad did, but my mom made the decision early on to make sure that I became an American before I was a Peruvian. And so she taught me English and, and she, even though she has an accent herself, she made sure that she talked to me in English so that when I went to school, I didn't have an accent. Little decisions like that and decisions like sending me to a private school, a Catholic school, and, and allowing me to fail later in life to kind of work out my own morality was a huge part of that. But one of the best things that my parents ever did for me was sending me to a school that was separate from my supposed experiences as wow. Hispanic statistics. Wow. And um, for me, that, that was, I look back on it and I'm just like, if I've ne if I never had like my eyes open to that side of the world, I would have I would have never had these opinions. You know, I would have been very gung ho in a different direction. But it's funny, it's funny because my my mom was all about sending me to Catholic school in a in a white neighborhood or whatever you want to call it in an upscale neighborhood. My dad was the opposite. He wanted to make sure I had the opposite experience. So. I did karate for most of my life growing up and we did karate in, in the nearest inner city, which I lived in at the time called Patterson, New Jersey. And we would oh, be yeah. part of Patterson and we'd be, I'd be there literally every day of the week, Saturday and Sunday after school. So my school during the day, I would be in an affluent neighborhood and at night I'd be in an inner city. And so I had this duality of perspectives that I think just made for the perfect kind of mix of like, all right, now I just want to work out for myself. What is the actual truth of the matter? That's that's awesome. And uh, Patterson, New Jersey, on a side note, is uh, the same uh, city that the the movie Lean on Me was yes. taken. Joe Clark and I did a, a top ten black men influential roles in movies. It just reminds me because he was Joe Clark was one of those uh, figures. And so um, Patterson, yeah. uh, from what I understand, is it's not um, it's not Beverly Hills, right? No, not at all. And it's funny you bring up uh, Joe Clark in that movie because it was it was a bit really formative movie for me growing up. I mean, just to see somebody hold people accountable, regardless of what they look like, regardless of who they are, or where they come from, he refused to take excuses. And that's why people looked at him like such a bad person. I actually had a friend of mine whose mother went to school 
while Joe Clark was there, like Joe Clark. Wow. Knew and wow. Um, she would tell me the same thing. Like there, there was no excuses when it came to that man. It was either you accept full responsibility and you say that you did wrong or you accept the consequences of your actions. And, and for me, that was so formative. It was, it was a completely transforming movie for me. Yeah. And I think I, the, I think it was because it was, you know, in Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A good friend of mine is from Patterson as well. He would tell yeah. me a lot of stories about, about that, uh, that area. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, I think one of the, uh, the first steps of a highly influential people is to recognize that you are responsible for your situation and owning that. That's like the first step in becoming a successful person. And I yeah. think that's one thing we're missing. I, tell you, I don't want to spoil your video, but I, I, I got to keep going back to it because I mean, you, you well, I'll give you a little nugget before you, before sure. you go there. Sure. Um, sure. But funny enough, the first person that really got me thinking about self accountability that way, even before I started really going, going to church a lot was Gary Vee, which most people would yeah. think oh, he's just like an entrepreneur guy, but his, un, his unrelenting pr uh, pursuit of like, it's all on you really yeah. just kind of laid the foundation for me to be like, okay, since it's all on me, what else do I have to do and who else do I need to learn from in order to better myself? And that kind of piqued my interest as well. Yeah, Gary Vee is intense. My wife is really, really big into him. And yeah. uh, he is, he takes no crap, man. He's like, <laughs> like and that's, that's, now that's like my dad, my dad's same way. He was very much like, there's no excuse, man, you know, do the work. And that's one thing you mentioned as well, do the work. And yeah. so from, from his um, own words, I guess. So, um, I think I'm jumping around, but I want to just uh, talk a little bit about family. Uh, you talked about family, and uh, how what does what does family mean to you? I'll leave it at that. What does family mean to you? So family, family for me is. I mean, I'll, I'll show you. I have a sign right here, right out of the reach, right, right out of reach from the camera. It says, "Love your family, work super hard, and live your passion." And um, for me, it, it's everything. It's the consistent support group that helps you build together. So just looking at it from like a societal level, it's the people that when you arrive, me being Hispanic, when my parents arrived from Peru, their family was the ones that helped build them up and make them into something. And then they return the favor for the next person from the family that came here. So it's, it's the ultimate support group. It's the ultimate reality check. It's people that are willing to hold you accountable and call you out on your BS. And, and it... it it's supposed to be a unit, you know, it's supposed to come first until you become married and then your wife becomes your family. And um, that for me is, is just such a big principle to that. I kind of put my life on to the point where when that's being questioned by the left, then I'm just like, yeah, I'm out. You're going to make some young lady very happy one day. If you're not already, <laughs> if you're not already married yourself, but I'll tell you, um, I yeah, know, I'm, I, I'm <laughs> I hundred percent agree. Family is is the nucleus of of society, in my opinion, and uh, well, not my opinion. I think it's just a fact. So, I mean, I think we're so careful now to say well, we're so careful now to say the truth, and we all sugarcoat the truth. And I think that's causing a problem in society in general. Absolutely, hundred percent. I think one of the things that I've been talking about on Instagram more than more than on YouTube, just because I, I'm I like I enjoy um, the idea of language is a huge component of what's going on right now. People are kind of taking the use of language and, and changing it around to mean whatever it is that they mean. So we have to be very specific when we say family, we have to be very sure what we mean by family. And we have to be very sure what people mean when they say, you know, these buzzwords, racism, hom homophobia, all, all this stuff. And so for me, that's been a big push. Like when I'm arguing with somebody or when somebody's arguing with me, I try and define the terms first. What do you mean by this word? And that's actually a good a segue into what I want to ask you next is that, uh, you mentioned something about, well, you mentioned think critically, and you mentioned how you, you kind of con contracted that against with John Lennon and his song that you love so much, which we all love. It's a great song. So good. And so can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So when I used to play the song or I used to listen to the song all the time, it was very much from a, an emotional space of like, the music makes me feel good. And the idea, of, the idea of the John Lennon brand made me feel connected to a, a nostalgic past that I was never a part of. But when I started looking at the words of the song, and, and this was partially when I was starting to learn how to, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Imagine, by the way. Yeah, Imagine, exactly. Um, when I started learning the actual song lyrics to play it, I was like, oh, imagine there's no heaven. Wait, you know, no hell below. So it got to the point where I started realizing there's, they, he wants to imagine away everything in life. And I didn't have a name for that. I didn't know what that was called, but I was like, that doesn't seem right. And eventually, you know, a couple of years later, I'm discovering this is pretty much a nihilistic song. This is a song about complete 
you know, just absence of all possessions, absence of everything. Uh, so then what are we living for? What What is meaningful then? And then the, the cliche answer, of course, would be love. But if you don't have heaven or hell, you don't have possessions, you don't have good relationships, then there's no love. Where's the love in all that? You know, in the famous words of Justin Timberlake. <laughs> I thought that was such a, a I was I took a, a page and a half of notes, dude. Wow. A page and a half of notes, and I'm scribbling through them now and kind of marking to make sure I don't miss any points here. But that nihilism, I hadn't even I heard that term used before, but never in the context that, that you mentioned. Mm. And um, I'm telling you right now, everyone sees this video, I'm gonna be sounding like you in, in, in the next few. <laughs> it's like he got that from Angel. Oh yeah, I did. No, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> the idea of nihilism for me is very much one that keeps popping up because the the generation, probably my generation and the generation below me, which is like Gen Z and stuff like that, are very nihilistic. They're very cynical for no yeah. apparent reason. And it's because they have such an overexposure of information that yes. I think it's easy for them to be become apathetic. And then after apathy comes nihilism where you're just like, you know what? There's so much going on. I don't even care. I mean, to think about how many shootings and bombings and all this that people in that generation have seen on their cell phone is just unbelievable. So, point. of course, they're going to become desensitized to that. Like Dave Chappelle, I'm sure you've seen, uh, talks a little bit about that in the age of spin. He says, like, this is the, the um, generation of information. You know, this is the age of spin where everything that you see isn't really what you're seeing, but you're seeing so much of it that you become desensitized. And I think wow. that's so important to understand because... Wow we need we need that grounding presence and for me that's my faith that's god that will continue to make us feel and that will continue to give us empathy in in the right way and not just empathy for the for the sake of saving face yeah and you also mentioned postmodernism as well and i it still happened that i, I ran across an uh, interview today and i'm going to put it in a link below it's basically about how postmodernism has caused this generation to be like just like you said so i'll leave it in the link below but um, you got, so can you kind of, is that the same thing, postmodernism as nihilism, or is it a little bit different or? So they're, they're slightly different in the, in the sense that nihilism is a view that nothing matters, nothing ultimately matters. Whereas postmodernism okay. is a view that nothing is actually real. So oh, there's gotcha. up and down, or there's no, inf there's no definite morals. There's no objective morality. And that quickly descends into nihilism because if there's no objective morality, then there's nothing stopping anybody from doing anything and nothing matters. So they kind of come hand in hand and they get conflated with Marxism, but it's not me conflating them. It's the people who are engaging in these kind of worldviews and ideologies that take the two and pair them together because you can't, you can't be a, real, or a, a realist and claim that women can become men and men can become women. You need the postmodern... Um, worldview to pair alongside your your cultural Marxism, if you will, and then have this idea that men can become women. And you can't tell me anything about that because it's my truth. So the truth is subjective. Gotcha. Yeah. And in fact, we're about to get into a Christian apologetics. I used to run a Christian apologetics website back in the 90s. I love but that. It, it's kind of out of context for this discussion. But at this point, Angel, I'm glad you brought that up. We're getting at the point now with this whole thing that happened with George Floyd. We're getting to the point now with what Christianity, which we're about to get into a little bit. We're getting into a situation where you can't talk about this stuff until you get to a basic foundation of truth. And my basis will be your basis, will be a biblical foundation, a worldview, uh, in my opinion, that will be six-day creation, guy rests on seven, not the, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the primordial soup, you know, billions of years, because now that means nothing. Now we're just we're just atoms bouncing against each other. Right. So Dude, and that's kind of that that's the that's that's the duality, right? So um, but that's kind of the context we're going to have to start talking about at a cultural, spiritual level. I think we're, I think we're there now. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. I think maybe a year ago, two years ago, I would have been able to become a political commentator or whatever, and not have to bring up that I'm a Christian. But at this point we're getting to, to the, the distillation, I guess would be a good word for it of every idea to the point of, well, is this objectively true? Is a man objectively a man? And what does that mean? And when you come yeah. to those conclusions or when you come to those questions, it becomes beyond natural. It becomes supernatural. It becomes mystical, right? Um, mythical rather. And um, then you have to take it into another level of, of uh, I guess, debate or conversation where now you're you're debating the divine and you're not just debating the, the, re the reality. So philosophy and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'd love to dive into woke Christianity if that's what you have. 
Oh no, no, that, I'm not gonna get to that. I was gonna. I just wanted to say that that's kind of where we are in terms of arguments. I yeah. I want to go there, but I, I kind of want to go back to your what you talked about. You what you wanted to talk about. I want to get to that, and uh, but you brought it into a context of which I found very interesting. In case people who now are just seeing this, I am a black person. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty obvious, but I thought, I thought that one time was pretty funny. It was someone got thought it was funny. I, so I, I say it now and then, but but um, you mentioned about black people um, in terms of like how you know being in the um, I guess in the community wanting to get out of the community or owning part of the community. Mm. Uh, that was a really good point, and I've been doing black stuff. I mean, black you know black power stuff. So I used to be a a black you know militant back in college. I used to be one of those kind of guys. But oh, wow. but that right there was never something we actually talked about. We talked about ownership, entrepreneurship, but we never talked about it in the context and the framework that you put it in. Can you kind of explain what you're talking about in terms of your experience of black people being in the in the in the in the uh, in the community wanting to get out or owning part of it? Yeah. So a big part of growing up uh, in in those kind of surroundings is is the kind of barbershop talk or you know just hanging out on you know in front of your house kind of talk where you're talking about the dreams that you have and the aspirations with all your friends and some of those dreams are like oh I want to own a store I want to start a record label I want to you know I want to open up a I want to open up a barbershop and those things slowly decay as we got older and to the point where it's like if one person actually achieved that, they were kind of met with bitterness or resentment or yeah. it kind of mask, masked as bitterness or resentment, but it was actually jealousy. And it was almost right. like they got accused of, oh, you're turning your back on your hood. You're 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 you forgot where you came from, all of these kind of things. And, and it's happened to me. You know, I have people, friends that are, still live in the, in the center of Patterson. I'd go to visit them and they they'd just look at me and they would just completely ignore me. They're like, yo, you changed. You don't even know who you are anymore. And um for, for me, that, that was so, so big at changing my worldview because I'm, I'm thinking about these people that I love. Like I grew up around these people and some of them didn't feel the, the same urge to just up and leave it all behind. And I think that's also part of the problem. Like I, like I was saying in my walkaway video, the problem is it isn't the color of somebody's skin. It's a circumstance that they're born into, which is enhanced by culture and everything attached to that culture is telling them what they're doing is being glorified, like rap music and, and the movies like Boys in the Hood and all that kind of stuff. It's all just lumping in the same message and beating the same message down the, into their brains, which is, you know, uh, you just got to sell drugs sometimes. Sometimes you just got to rob somebody. Something, and, and it's just those things keep getting perpetuated over and over again. And that's, to me, so unfortunate, but it's something that... I've seen happen and I've seen destroy people's lives. Yeah, I think that statement there is going to really resonate with our audience because I think we can all kind of uh, can see that in different parts of our lives as we've walked away that may, may not be as drastic as you and me, but other people, like a knitting community. I did a video of a <laughs> person who was doing knitting and they and she got canceled because she made a comment that people didn't like and it was got really bitter. So, I mean, but... <sighs> So let me I, ask you a question. I actually saw the knitting um, community. Did, I, I saw one episode. I wasn't sure if it was yours. It was a while ago, so it very much could have been your your video before I knew you. But it was a big deal, but, wasn't it? I mean, it was, it, it was, yeah, it, it was I crazy. Found that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would think if you're going to be in a safe space, you would think that would be a place you could be safe in, right? Right. Anyway. You would think so. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, so what do you think in terms of? I know what I feel. But I don't, uh, I don't know the Latino Hispanic perspective as much. But what do you think is the biggest myth for um, Latinos or Hispanics in terms of the way people perceive them in terms of wanting to vote a certain way or uh, values or anything that you think that we don't that our audience probably wouldn't know that you would think we think we know. Yeah, um, it, I actually have a funny story about that. And remind me of the question if I veer off too much. But okay. so I'm, I'm on I'm on this Christian dating app. It's not Christian Mingle, but I am on it. And um, I I, I uh, connected with somebody. Uh, she was a black girl, very, very beautiful. And I have on my bio written, you know, that I'm a conservative. So if you if you're not OK with that, you know, just don't don't swipe. It's fine. And um, so she she swipes. And on top of that, she starts to ask me about why I'm a conservative and am I a Trump supporter and this isn't that. And I'm very like respectful. I'm just like, listen, I'm not here to have a political debate or anything, but 
um, if, if that's not cool with you, then maybe this won't work out. And, and her response was, was very kind of enlightening to the way people see the Latino community in regards to like political parties. And she's like, are you okay with the fact that Republican people want to kick your people out? And I think that's the big myth about la Latinos is that we're, we're not necessarily, that we want everybody to come here illegally. And, and, and that's not the case at all. Most Latinos who have, who have come here, done the legal work, done the, the whole process, are proud of the fact that they're Americans and they're proud of the fact that they've gone through all those steps to become actual naturalized citizens. And, and that to me says more than somebody who crossed the border illegally, mind you, it could be that they had to come illegally. It could be that there were circumstances that made, made for that. But to, to say that that negates the fact that we're allowed to vote for a specific political party or that we don't uh, appreciate America to the same degree or benefit from America in the same degree as a white person who was born here, that, that's completely absurd. Well, let me ask you this question because I I'm, I'm honestly don't know the answer to this question. What do you think is the reason why people feel we have to be in a, in a, in a box politically to, to vote a certain way? That's tough. I, I do, you think, think it, do you think it's malicious or do you think it's calculated? Do you think it's just ignorance or all of the above? Or I think it, it's a little bit of everything. I think from a governmental standpoint, it's very easy to make the democratic appeal to minorities that we're the people, we're the, we're the, uh, the party of the, of the people. We're here to protect you as a minority. I think that's a very easy sell from, from a governmental level. But then when it comes to the actual individuals who are going through these things, I think it's it's a little bit of propaganda mixed with a little bit of culture and just what your family tells you. You know, like yeah. the, the Spanish channel Univision is a, a Spanish news channel, a Hispanic news channel. It always covers the Democratic talking points and never gives you any kind of it never veers from just the standard Democrat platform talking points. And I think that's a huge part of the issue. And, and I don't know if there's a bigger conspiracy. I'm Like I keep saying in my videos, I'm not a tinfoil hat guy, but um, yeah. I, I think that there is some sort of agenda there, but I do think that us as a culture have done it to ourselves as well. Yeah, I found it interesting going back to the earlier point. You said you want to educate yourself and you basically said that you wanted to just, and you were just lining up different issue on different issue. And then you said that you found out that you were, not a not a Democrat, or you're not a liberal. Can you talk yeah. about that? You just kind of just just finding issues and just lining it, lining up what you felt, and you just came to the conclusion that you were not one uh, liberal, right? Is that correct? Yeah, I just I just kind of took it upon myself. I just wrote down a little list of like what I believed in as far as the different political issues of the time. Before I even did any research, I was like, well, pro life or poor choice. Well, I I don't think aborting a baby is really oh, okay. You know. Um, I don't think it's really good. So I'm just going to say pro-life. I don't know. It just sounds better. And and just loosely based on whatever my understanding was of, of it at the time. Same thing about, about the government being in marriage at all. You know, I just didn't want the government involved in marriage at all. Do I think people should be able to worship anyway? Absolutely. Yeah, um, pretty much any political thing that you could think of that's not like foreign policy, because I'm not an expert on foreign policy at all. And um I just kind of went through the list. And the more I started researching, finding people like Ben Shapiro and, and kind of putting them up against like, you know, let's say Cenk Yoger from the Young Turks or something. Yeah. The more I was kind of sold on the ideas of the right, like because they aligned with who I was. You know, I'm I, I'm by nature, like I don't necessarily love the whole free love thing. I mean, there's certain pressures on us as men in, in a society that's mostly progressive at this point to be able to date different women. And that's perceived as some sort of value, but that stood in opposition to my Christian standards. And so that even pushed me a little bit more away from the left. And, and the more I went down those things, the more I started realizing I, I line up pretty, pretty much on the right consistently on everything. So here's a little question for you. This is going right. <laughs> to, so what do you think the, the church, and I, I think you already know the answer to this, or at least you have an idea. What do you think the church's response to what you just said, everything we just said, and either they weren't paying attention to it, but now someone smacked them in the back of the head, look at this, look at this, look at this, and now their response to that and their interactions with the church and how they're expecting Christians to behave given this woke Christianity, for lack of a better term, um, um, situation we have here in, uh, in America. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I did see a big, I, I will say this, the church as a whole 
I'd say most of the Christian church has been asleep at the wheel when it comes to politics, right? You do have, you know, Catholic churches and, and some of the more reformed churches that are actually going out and advocating against abortion and stuff like that. And against, you know, uh, the slave trafficking. And, you know, then you have the more progressive or charismatic uh, church doing the, you know, gi giving food to the homeless and doing these kind of things. But for the most part, we were asleep at the wheel of mainstream politics for a long time. And when this hit, it was an opportunity for the charismatic churches or the progressive churches, the more mainstream ones, forward think, forward facing ones that have a lot of, of eyeballs on them. It was a very it was a very easy opportunity for them to show that they care about the world. And it was very well intentioned, you know, like, yes, of course, Black Lives Matter. You know, of course, all of this is is we need to be doing this. We need to change. But what they didn't realize, which I think more reformed churches did because they've been kind of studying the Calvinist versus Armenian movement. And then they've been studying Marxism and all this stuff for much longer. They didn't yeah. realize that the idea of just saying Black Lives Matter was buying into an ideology that was completely against everything that's in scripture, you know, and it's not the fact that that this single incident was wasn't bad because the George Floyd incident was horrendous. But it was the idea that now showing your allegiance to this specific group uh, this, this specific group implies so much more than what they thought it implied, you know, because right. this is a political party. This is an organization that takes money and donates it to the Democratic Party. This is not just um, a, a hashtag trend. Yeah, I, I got into some heated arguments of people who are near and dear to me. And if this person sees it, he'll know exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. But I won't bring go into that. But this whole situation is not only dividing people it's dividing families it's splitting churches in half it's it's really come to a uh, it's coming to a point now it's really really dangerous for our society and i think you nailed it right on the head when you said that the church has been asleep at the wheel you, you mentioned um armenian versus calvinist and reform i know all about that and those aspects look at god in different ways and our responsibility in dealing with that um so i don't know who, if there is a fault there but i do know that i think we just needed to look into it more before we jump head over heels over what's going on. Because like you said before, I'm gonna, this is my next question to you. The, the Black Lives Matter, like you said earlier on, you said the left is very good at words. Who can possibly be against Planned Parenthood? Sounds great, right? <laughs> but who, who can be against Black Lives Matter? But they do that for a reason. And you, want to talk, you talked about that in your video. And I think if the church had understood a little bit more about that, then they wouldn't be out there on the forefront of something that's not biblical. Because I think at, at, at the very worst, BLM has been hijacked by a group of people who hate America. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think, you know, when it comes to the church's response, overall, I do think it was well-intentioned, super well-intentioned people that just want to care about people or want to care about the plight of their own, of their own community. And I totally understand that. And I understand the pain. Um, but I, I think that the response should be now going forward the response should be for a united church that looks at Bi the bible as the sole authority over their political views you know and and i don't i don't think there should be like people trying to red pill each other or you know just trying to make each other woke i think it should be like okay what does scripture say about these instances and how can right. we move forward from there as right. opposed to just trying to debate talking points like, you know, well, right. you know, there's more black people born, um, uh, aborted in New York City than, than are actually born every day. You know, all, all of these things, ultimately, we have to come together. We have to have the unifying fact. We have to go back to that. And we have to do it in a way without damaging relationships. Yes, you know, yes. It, that's, it, so, it, that's so. Yeah. So that's it, so true, because I, I think <laughs> we keep missing each other. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, in my opinion, I think there's, there has to be a place for us to, um, to kind of come together and say, what are we as a church going to believe in? What are we going to prioritize? And um, without risking relationships, and we have to make sure to do it all with love and to make sure that we all um, not put other people's feelings at the expense of biblical truth. We have to kind of find a way to give that biblical truth to people that may not necessarily want it right now. Well, let me ask you this question. Let's get more in theology or just basically yeah. basic goodness. Uh, what would be your, and this is way off, off script. This is not, <laughs> what do you think, and this may be helpful for people in the audience right now, for people who have gone through a situation where they were at the dinner table, they had their brother, 
their sister and they had an argument or something and now they won't talk to each other over something like this mm. um but each side wants to come together what's going to be a good way for one person to to reconcile those differences because we're going to have to have healing first before we can go forward on some of this stuff you hit the nail on the head we have to have healing absolutely i think for what's worked for me in those situations was being very specific about my goals when it when when we were having the the discussion or the argument right so I, i'd be very clear to say listen this is nothing against you this is the research that i've done i still love you and i still affirm you and i still want a relationship with you but if you choose otherwise then understand that it was you that decided to disconnect from me and not the other way around and I'm okay. just very, I'm very clear cut about that because the last thing that I want people to think, and this has been, this is like a big branding misconception about the right, right? I think it's the right doesn't care and the left does care. The right is uh, not sympathetic and the left is not, is sympathetic. And, and I think that's just wrong because we wouldn't be arguing these issues if we didn't care. I think we just, we care, we just have different solutions. And I think that has to come to the for forefront. We have to both be able to say to each other, listen, it's not that I don't care. It's that I don't agree with the solution, but I agree there should be a solution. So um, so what do you think would be the big uh, talking point when it comes to you have a situation where that brother and a sister, they're arguing, they agree to uh, disagree, but they're still stuck on this thing of systematic racism, which, which I don't believe exists. As you say really eloquently in your video, I think you do it very well. You do it just as well as Ben Shapiro did. And minus all the statistics, but wow. you you frame it in a way, now I'm being serious, because you frame it in a way that makes perfect sense. Of course, you got to go digging to get the facts, whatever. But um, so what do you think would be a, a good common ground to tell someone, look, this is systematic racism. And this is what it is. And this is how we can get by this, this issue that's definitely causing us to have a, a problem. That's that's interesting. I think if it's somebody that you're really close to, you have you have the accessibility to them to be able to hash things out over a longer period of time, right? So if it's a sibling that you live with, or if it's your spouse, you have the ability to talk things over multiple times. I think the the key talking point, I guess, to start at is: Do you think a person is in? Uh, innately good or do you think that a person is capable of complete evil and complete good wow, i think you start good. from that frame of reference and now you can build something cohesive that showcases what you actually believe as a worldview because most of the time people who are leaning more left maybe are still christians but they just have a different worldview they, they'll they'll say oh no people are mostly good like i i believe in people yeah. I have hope, which is a very uplifting uh thought to have but yeah. the fact of the matter is that God sees us as perfect because of our faith in Christ and not because we are good. So right. I think if we start from that frame of reference of like, well, what do you think about humanity? Do you think that somebody, do you think another one, do you think that somebody who is uh, bad can do good things? And do you think somebody that's good can do bad things? You know, because that will give us a firm understanding of history. Men who were great, like the founding fathers were obviously not perfect men. We're obviously not Jesus Christ himself. So they're going to have huge flaws that will make you see them as monsters. But in their day, they were just regular flaws. And so when we can look at history through the lens of taking the good with the bad and understanding where we are now, I think that's a healthier way to progress. So starting at the beginning of the human intention for the, the human disposition of the heart, I, I guess I'd call it. That's fantastic. In fact, because I want this, uh, this, this uh, interview here to be help to people out there because this is a serious issue that I've been, that I've been seeing. And it's, you're actually helping me because I'm asking questions about how I can help <laughs> patch, seriously, how I can help patch damages that I've done either on Facebook or in person where this whole thing came out with George Floyd. And next thing you know, it's like, because I'm not you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, all of a sudden I'm an uncaring person and how, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I think if I'm, if it's helping me, it's going to help many other people. So I really appreciate your, your input there. I think it's really constructive and I think it's going to be um, really beneficial. I think the key point you mentioned is do we have access to continually talk to them? Because otherwise you're just going to, like you said before, red pill them and basically I just got to show them love and basically just kind of step away and hope someone else catches them up with the information. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a big part of it. And I do think that there's um, an immediacy that needs to be had as well. Let's say it's not somebody that you're that close, that you're always around, but you're close to them. You genuinely like them as people. 
if you have those little spats with them on Facebook or whatever, I think it's important to go out of your way to call them and be like, listen, let's talk this through really quick. Let me just talk to you and just show them your humanity really quick. Show them that you're still the same person. And a lot of the times it's going to take somebody that's very overly vindictive to still after that be like, no, I, you're different than what I thought. You know, it's going to take somebody a lot more energy. But if you just confront them and be like, listen, I'm still the same person. You know, we're still cool or whatever. We just have different views. Most of the time, reasonable people will be like, yeah, I understand. I don't agree. I think you're kind of schmuck now, but, you know, still, I love you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's great. I think that's great. I think um, thank you for that. So um, I want to ask you a couple more questions. I don't want how much time we got here. I want to make sure I, I, I uh, cover the questions. I hope I, I hope I covered what we talked about initially before the interview happened. I think we have. Um, but I want to ask you a couple questions that you may not have been asked a lot. What are you most excited about right now? I, you, you, look, I mean, on a more personal side, you can get as you can tell me shut up if you want. But yeah. I guess from yourself, you have a bright future ahead of you because just from what I'm seeing, your presentation with the way you're set up your microphone and the way you're the way you the way you speak, you you have a really really good um, way of talking where it's you actually have something to say and you're going somewhere with it and you don't mess around with it and it makes it really compelling to listen to. And I tell you, so what are you most excited about outside of you know it could be the podcast or it could be YouTube or it could be anything. What are you most excited about right now going on in your life or what you see potentially with this country? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to look forward to. I mean, I, the only reason that I, I was planning on talking about this earlier, but the only reason that I've really started to be so forward about all my political views was because I got let go from my job due to COVID recently. So I'm excited not only about the podcast, but the potential to do uh, freelance again because I, I'm in digital marketing for a living. So, you know, to do like content creator stuff and just to be creative in general. I'm just, there's so much creativity right now, so much time to be able to do it, maybe, you know, work on some music. That's not something I'm super good at, but I just enjoy it. And, um, you know, I'm excited about the things happening in my church. You know, right now we've, we've kind of got to a place where we have a rhythm about doing online services and doing kind of Zoom calls and meeting in person a little bit still. So just getting to build in that regard, too, is, has been a lot of fun. And um, those are the things I'm really excited about. As far as my personal life goes, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert, so I'm not like a big social butterfly. But I am excited about seeing people again when this whole COVID thing kind of starts to die down. And, um, you know, just stuff like that. That's great, man. I I, don't, uh, I, I just want to thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing time with, with me and the audience and we're growing on this channel, and this is going to be seen by a lot more people. Had it been uh, two months ago, we're, we're we're getting we're getting some good some good views, and I'm going to push it out there. And uh, I, you have free reigns to to do what you want with this as well. I love but, it. Um, I just but, wanted uh, to thank you much for yeah. the opportunity, man. Yeah. So you want to uh, tell everybody if you have questions for me, it's great. If otherwise, do you have anything you want to um, tell the audience, or or how they can reach you, or how they can plug into what you're trying to do and support you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I do have some questions for you. That I'll probably ask oh, you sure. all fair. Yep. I want to. I want to get your your feedback on just this whole sure. YouTube thing, you know. But um, yeah, for me, what what I'm doing now is uh, you can reach me at an Instagram at underscore Angel Kiros, just like it's spelled on the title. I'm assuming. Um, you can reach me on uh, Parlor, which is the same thing, Angel Kiros. And you can reach me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Angel Kiro. So we'll see how that goes. I'm doing my best to do like interviews like this with the people that are going to be my patrons. And uh, just maybe we'll do some Bible studies. I'm trying to figure out, probably sell some merch since I'm a designer. And um, maybe give away some if you if you become a Patreon member. So I'm just trying to, all different things and yeah. really just trying to build a community around this. And, and I think uh, uh, I think your platform has really afforded me that. So thank you so much again, man, for, for just letting me come on here and just spill my guts. Well, I won't be the last person because uh, this you're going to be getting a lot more calls for this. I think you're you're natural. You have the ability to to convey thought and and you invoke emotion in, in myself because I'm just so, I never met you. I've only spoke to you first time ever today, but we spoke a couple times online and uh, I'm so proud of you for what you've done wow. and, and what you've done in your life and, we, and where you're going. I just... Can't wait to see where you're going to be in, in two years. It's going to be incredible. So, just Thank don't you. forget, just don't forget small people. Okay. <laughs> never, bro. Never. You're going to be the first shout out when I when I make it. <laughs> 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 What's good? Uh, you don't have to say that, man. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, so so with that, I'm gonna cut this. I'm gonna cut this where it is because we're gonna edit this and put it up. So, 
Um, Angel, thank you so much. God bless you. We have so much in common. I, I look forward to talking to you offline and, and in the future. I, I consider you a friend. So Likewise. everyone, I hope you enjoyed this interview. This is something we don't do often here. We hope to do more of these. Find people online. They're just super talented, super impassionate, super excited about doing life in the right way. I don't care what you vote. Just I, I don't oh, I do care how you vote, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, think why you're voting and understand, you know, go through the go through why you're voting, you know, and if it uh, ideals line up with what you feel, then uh, go for it. But uh, I think if as humans, we thought logically, we would all be voting a certain way and that would be. Uh... <laughs> anyway, so with that, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. Angel, thank you so much again for coming on. And yeah. if you like what we do with this channel, we take culture, TV and movies, and we filter your rights. Please hit the like and subscribe button. And by the way, subscribe to Angel's channel. The links go right there. Subscribe to him. Go to his Patreon. Give this guy some love. Go to his, um, his parlor account and uh, just give him the support he needs to get where he needs to go. He's going places, everybody. I'm telling you right now. So with that, everyone, have a good day. And I will talk to you guys next time.